I would like to call to order this Monday, May 20th, 2024 meeting of the East Hampton Board of Education. If you would please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and it is well with liberty and justice for all. It is the mission of the East Hampton Schools to partner with our families and community to prepare confident, compassionate, and collaborative learners who navigate a complex global society. First up this evening is some a student recognition. Thank you very much. Uh, we have in the audience tonight a Voice of Democracy Award winner, multiple time winner, uh, Bailey Ozaki. Bailey, if you would come forward. And we'll have you face this way so we can get you on the camera. Perfect. Oh, perfect. You can right face here. you can face the audience because we want your pictures to take. We want your parents to take a lot of pictures. So <laughs> don't hesitate, Mom. Get that camera right out. And would you introduce the board to your parents? Um, yeah, these are my parents. Um, my mom is Chris and Ozaki Owen, and my dad is Paul Owen. Great. Thank you both very much for coming tonight. This was written up by the social studies department, uh, describing Bailey's uh, success. So Bailey Ozaki's multi-year accomplishments with the Voice of Democracy competition is admirable. Bailey has not only participated in the Veterans of Foreign War speech competition for multiple years, but has placed for multiple years as well. This year's Bailey's submission on the greatest attributes of American democracy not only came in first within the local VFW division, but then placed at the state level. This accomplishment opened the door for Bailey to compete at the national level, sending both her and her family on a trip to Washington, D.C., where she was able to tour the White House and meet other students from across the United States. We are proud of Bailey's achievements and dedication to the VFW speech contest and the mission of honoring American patriotism. Bailey, congratulations to you. You don't believe this? This is the part where Bob can come right up front. We're going to do some pictures. Can you hold the plaque? We'll get Mrs. Kohler, board chair, on one side. I can hide behind. No, come here. Here you go. Thank you, Doc. Congratulations to you. And we anticipate uh, seeing you next year uh, as well as the winner. No pressure. No pressure. I know, it's not awful to say, huh? <laughs> I think she's already started next year's SAT. <laughs> it was a good, a good experience for her to go, because this way she saw how everyone wrote. That's, that's awesome. wonderful. Wonderful. Congratulations. You are welcome to stay for the meeting, but if you would like to slip out the door, you are more than welcome. We promise ice cream. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> We'd like to move our Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, next up, inner board liaisons. I don't think we have anyone here in the room with us tonight. I do see Jordan online with us. Jordan, is there anything you'd like to share? No hands. No hands. Oh, there no it goes. Hi. Good evening. I'm not. I wasn't sure how to say yes without raising my hand. So, um, yeah. I I just uh, want to reiterate that we forwarded the budget uh, for referendum, and I wanted to thank you all uh, very much for the work that you all put in to presenting a, a responsible and pretty slim budget in a uh, you know in a world of the finance, financial realities that we are all facing. Um, so I just, I think you should all be commended for the work that went into that budget, including the superintendent and staff and everybody. So just thank you very much. And that's all I, I have for tonight. Thank you, Jordan. We appreciate the efforts of the town council and the board of finance as well. It was a good team effort this year. 
Uh, labor union representatives, I have not heard from Neil this evening, so we have no report. Audience of citizens? Guessing none. I'm assuming, Jordan, your hand's still up from before. <laughs> Oh, can I still speak? Do I still have a microphone? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I did actually want to make <clears throat> a comment. Um, I'm Jordan Worma, 32 Oak Knoll Road. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on the proposed policy regarding the after school hours use of the uh, school facilities. Um, there's some language that's being removed from this proposed policy that concerns me. There's Specifically, uh, quote, the use of these facilities by responsible community organizations, unquote, and granting use for, uh, again, quoting, educational, cultural, civic, social, recreational, governmental, or general political nature and other non-commercial uses, unquote. Um, this language is being replaced with a sort of a reductive list of approved town-sponsored athletics um, and nonprofit groups, again, highlighting that half or more of participants have to be from East Hampton. And I don't have any issue with that 50% caveat, though I am concerned as to how that percentage is going to be calculated on a case-by-case -case basis and at the subjective discretion of those who are able to authorize or deny the facility use. Um, and also, obviously, I'm understanding and supportive of the need to restrict site use during school hours. Fully support that. However, um, I would strongly encourage that the language be reconsidered uh, that's being put into this policy. East Hampton is, a, as we know, a small community, but we are very fortunate to benefit from numerous non-athletic community groups that provide not only educational, cultural, civic, and recreational opportunities. Uh, but what we do not have is a supply of venues appropriate to the activities that so many of our community members count on. And while not every member of the community you know, needs or should have carte blanche access to the schools, every member of the community should have the opportunity to request, <clears throat> excuse me, to request such use when it's appropriate. I mean, that's what a public facility is about, you know, being a community resource. And as someone who's volunteered in every one of our schools over the years in the theater and arts community, and as a resident, uh, hopefully, obviously, heavily invested in the prosperous future of East Hampton, um, I'm a little heartbroken by some of the language in this new policy and on the impact it may have on the future of theater and performance art in East Hampton. Um, the new policy just removes the application process completely. Uh, there's not a lot of clarity around how any anyone or any group would apply. Um, and it appears to place profit over community use and for a public facility that to me that is just wrong. Um, I've lived in a lot of places, I've used a lot of community facilities, and I've never seen um, this sort of restriction placed on a publicly funded educational facility. So I hope that this policy as it stands will be rejected just so that it can be reviewed um, and incorporate some of the potential losses uh, to the community, it maybe be considered at a future meeting. Um, that, that's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you. Right. I'm assuming we have no other audience of citizens. So moving on to the consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which contains the minutes from the May 6th meeting, as well as the resignation of two teachers as listed in item numbers 14.1 and 14.2? So moved. Second. And if a motion is second, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Josh? Are you voting in favor of the motion? I was not here for the BDS 6. Okay, so you're abstaining? Oh. Yeah, declining. Okay, I believe you're abstaining. Abstaining, yep. Committee reports. Uh, Student Board of Education representatives do not appear to be with us this evening. So we will catch up with them on another day. Update by district administrator is Marion. Good evening. 
Uh, first, the district PDAC committee met today to finalize planning for this school year and to start to plan ahead for the 24-25 school year. We've been planning for that in many ways, but PDAC specifically was looking at that. Um, the committee reviewed teacher survey feedback from the March 28th PD day. That was the last PD day that we held, and this was the first time that PDAC had met since then. Um, and we had really positive feedback from teachers about that professional learning. Um, we finalized all of our plans for this Friday's early release. We had been um, underway with that, but everybody was just able to coordinate any last moving parts. We reviewed our 2023-2024 parent feedback survey. Um, so that was open from April 15th to May 15th. Um, so we were able to review that information, which will inform building improvement efforts for next school year. The principals also review that very carefully, and PDEC looks for trends that can be incorporated into professional learning. So in the areas for growth and improvement that maybe we can support um, our staff around. The PDEC completed a final review of our educator evaluation and development model, which we will look at more closely this evening. And um, finally, we created an outline for our August 2024 PD schedule um, based on what we know at this time. Um, and we started more involved plans to roll out our educator evaluation plan in August. So teachers are getting an update this spring about what that eval plan includes, and then we'll have a more involved professional learning experience for them in August. Um, in the area of assessment, with the exception of a few final makeups, all of the Smarter Balanced Assessments and NGSS assessments are complete for this school year. The window closes um, next Friday, May 31st, so buildings are just making sure to catch up with any students who may have been ill or traveling during the assessment window, so we have only a few left. Um, additionally, the high school AP exams wrapped up on Friday, May 17th. So the East Hampton High School facilitated AP exams in U.S. government and politics, statistics, computer science A, uh, English literature, psychology, U.S. history, studio 2D art, drawing, calculus, English language, music theory, computer science principles, biology, and physics. Additionally, our K through 8 grade students are currently completing their final progress monitoring assessment of the year, um, I ready and reading, I ready reading and math. Um, the buildings really started um, last week and are finishing up this week. Um, as you know, these assessments are given three times a year, so this is an important data point uh, to see our students' growth. And we expect most students to complete the assessments this week, and any final makeups will take place next week. Additionally, last week, we completed our screening for our incoming kindergarten students. Um, and we will start working on planning their classroom placements for the 2024-2025 school year. If you've never been through it as a parent, Memorial does a really nice job. Um, families are able to schedule an appointment, and while their student interacts with some of our instructional specialists, um, parents are given an orientation, an information session, and administration there is very hands-on in, in that process. They are the gateway to our entire school system, so we consider that a very important event. Um, we have been in full appreciation mode, um, and I just wanted to take an opportunity to recognize that because of the many, many staff members who make our school system function and who contribute every day. Um, so at the beginning of May, we had our Teacher Appreciation Week um, events and celebrations, which were wonderful. And I just wanna really acknowledge all of the PTO organizations who assisted building administration and making sure our teachers really felt special. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Amy Ordonez from Studio 13 who came in and did a special um, no cost event for our teachers. We had yoga for them that week. We really tried to show them um, our, our deepest appreciation for all they give so generously each day. We celebrated our nurses, our ASOs, our local police department. Uh, next up this Friday, we'll recognize our custodians and cafeteria team, and then IT appreciation rounds out the month on May 31st. We know spring is in the air because the accomplishments of our students and the celebration of important milestones is well underway. I know you have the full list of events, but this is just a sampling of what's been going on and what's coming up. Um, last Wednesday was the East Hampton Middle School Band and Chorus Concert. If you weren't able to attend, you missed out. It was really um, a very exciting performance. Um, we're really excited at the growth of our middle school band. Um, I think a key um, component of that has been sort of the cross-age mentoring that we've put in place where our high school students are supporting middle school musicians. So it's a really great way for them to see that model performance and get excited for their high school uh, band program. Our East Hampton High School Academic Awards took place last Thursday evening. 
um, to a full house where we recognize student achievement across the high school population. The high school, as we were talking about, junior and senior prom was this past weekend at the Farmington Polo Club. So it was a wonderful celebration um, for our upperclassmen at the same, uh, or the night before, our third graders had their annual third grade dance, um, their first of hopefully many dances, as well as our seventh graders who had an under the stars theme dance uh, last Friday. Today was one of my favorite events all year, the Instrument Petting Zoo at Memorial School. Again, our high school band students introduced third graders to the instrument, instruments that they can play as they transition to center school, and we have an evening information for families tomorrow night. Um, and that is just one of like the best events. They come in and they, they bring the instruments, and I love that we call it the Petting Zoo because they all try them and play them and get to really experience that. Coming up, if your calendars are free, our eighth grade capstone event is tomorrow night. So we're excited to see the culmination of all of our eighth graders' hard work all year. Um, this week on May 22nd and 23rd, Memorial and Center Schools will host the author Daryl Cobb, which is really a kickoff to many writing celebrations. Friday, our middle school students participate in our annual Memorial Day celebration there. Um, and we have concerts uh, next week next week for the high school, this week on Wednesday for center school. Um, May 29th next week is the Memorial School Writing Celebration. Again, it's a, it's a great opportunity to see student work and our students and families uh, coming to celebrate all of that growth, really can see dramatic improvement in writing across that setting. Also next week, our uh, seventh and eighth graders leave for Quebec. We're really excited to bring that international travel opportunity back to our thriving French program. And next Friday is the Middle School Festival of Light for sixth graders. Um, so if you haven't seen the Festival of Flight, I recommend it. It's a culminating project for their technology education course. And that same day, our sophomore class trip to Holiday Hill, the senior class trip to Six Flags, and that evening is our fifth grade dance. So that's just the kind of stretch right now. June will be filled um, as we anticipate uh, field days, step up ceremonies, and much more. One of the other key things we do in June that I want to highlight is we host transition events for our rising fourth graders. So our third graders will go from Memorial School over to Center to get an orientation, and our rising sixth graders, so our fifth graders, will head over to the middle school. Our eighth graders complete those transition visits earlier in the year for scheduling purposes, but I think those are some nice opportunities for students to get excited for 24-25. Thank you. Mary? Yeah. Uh, when we will we be given the presentation on the results of the assessments that you talked about? So student performance data, the testing window is still open until May 31st. Sometime in June, the state will start releasing um, early data that they do not consider public. So we are not allowed to disclose that data until they indicate that to us, which is likely um, in late August. Um, it's been anywhere from mid to mid August to mid September in past years. About the SAT scores for the high school. The um, high school has that information and can share that. We can plan that presentation. Yeah, she probably should go be included with the others. Yes, usually we do all of that together. So, so sometime so, in June, August, no, August. the fall. The, the fall, the, the larger uh, data from grades three through eight and grade 11 can't be released publicly until September, really, at the earliest. Um, so I would anticipate that we typically do a fall student performance presentation in the first meeting in October, okay. either the first or the second. So we can talk about that timeline. Um, but the initial release that we get is is not um, publicly available. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Subcommittee so report. Um, no. No updates. Policy and curriculum, I know did not meet today, but we do have a few policies coming for later in the meeting. Finance, transportation, buildings, and grounds. Yes, the uh, budget referendum is June 4th. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Great, thank you. Mr. Smith, Superintendent's report. Yes, just very briefly. Uh, last week, the uh, town council approved the budget, as Augie said. Uh, the town meeting, which will be very brief, is uh, next Tuesday, the 28th. And we'll adjourn immediately to the referendum on June 4th. The uh, budget is currently under two bills. Uh, so hopefully we can get uh, the message out and get everybody to the polls and get that finished. Uh, Mary left, left, 
if your list of dates, just also highlight June 3rd, the, the top 10. Save that particular date. That's always a nice one for the board members to go. You really get to know our top 10 students and the mentors who had the uh, the strongest influence on them. It's, it's a wonderful night. Uh, some of the things in the budget that I want to make sure that, that you understand that we are doing, um, the middle school floor and gym floor, the hallway floors and the gym floor will be redone. We're using extra money from the roof project, uh, pending town council approval of that funds. Uh, that's going to really, the gym really needs uh, some work at, at the middle school. This will be a nice upgrade to that. And then all the hallways will be completed. And then the Memorial School rug, we're gonna have another uh, couple of hallways uh, lose the rug and add the floor to that as, as well. When we give you a nice tour of the middle school, uh, when you come back, uh, it will have all LED lighting in the classrooms and the hallways. I think it's gonna look uh, much brighter than it does now. And that is it. So tonight's um, program presentation is on the implementation of illustrative mathematics at the middle school. Um, joining me tonight is Camila Lewis, our sixth through eighth grade math specialist. We have our unfriendly microphone. Oh, we very friendly. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Camila. She's going to co-present with me. Um, tonight's presentation is really just an update. We've talked about illustrative mathematics in the past. Um, this was our first year of implementation, so we wanted to take this opportunity to um, introduce sort of the accomplishments of this school year and remind you of kind of how we got here. Okay. Um, I know, Sal, you asked about student performance data. Middle school math was an area that we're really focused on. I think it's really important to note that performance improvement um, is something we, we really plan for strategically. We knew that math was an area of concern for our district coming out of um, the COVID shutdown and, and subsequent, you know, modified instructional settings. So in addition to changing some of our staffing models, we really started to reflect and come up with a multi-year plan, um, starting first with bridges at the K-5 level. So um, just kind of to bring us back to that, there's a little timeline here you should be able to see on your slides. So in the 21-22 school year, when we were already well into um, our work on bridges at the K-5 level, we really started to research the best match for middle school. Bridges is a K-5 program, so it does not continue into middle school, and we knew we needed to find a solution for our middle school learners. Our student achievement data told us that what we were doing was not the best fit. Um, and so we really started to look at um, a variety of programs, and one of the key things that helped us to make our decision was districts that had high growth and high performance. We worked closely with the State Department of Education Performance Office to talk about, you know, what are those trends? And so they will not make recommendations on programs despite the vast amount of student performance data they have. So I just asked for, can you recommend the districts that you consider to have had the highest growth and the highest achievement? Um, and we started to really look at the math programming that those districts are using. Um, and after a thorough review process, really felt that I am and its uh, problem solving model would be the best fit for middle level learners. So in the 22-23 school year, we started the process of change at the middle school. We engaged our teachers in professional learning around the instructional model for illustrative mathematics, and we piloted units in classrooms. We really wanted to see how our students did with the program. That's something I really feel strongly that 
our teachers and our students interact with the program. Um, and so we were able to complete that in the 22-23 school year, last school year. And then in this school year, 23-24, we moved to a full implementation in grade six and seven. Um, we decided to grow into grade eight as opposed to changing that programming for students from one year in the middle school. Um, and so our current sixth and seventh graders are finishing their first year of IM. I think that uh, it's important to note that when choosing IM for the middle level, we talked with districts that use Bridges K-5 and IM 6-8. Um, Camila personally uh, oversaw some of that work and it helped us to really identify any alignment issues that we might want to um, consider where there are gaps that um, students may find in joining IM in sixth grade. So we were able to really pinpoint certain specific um, units that we wanted our teachers at the middle level to observe at center school and other areas where we could make sure that the um, transition from bridges in fifth grade would be seamless to sixth grade. Um, we really felt that the discourse that many of you have seen in action in, with Bridges through Number Corner and the nature of the workspaces in Bridges that we've, we've talked about in the past matched to IM. Um, you're going to hear me talk about using student discourse and accountable talk in mathematics classrooms as an important strategy to make sure that all students um, are engaging in the math curriculum and really benefiting from each other's thinking and learning. And then um, we really thought about how collaborative learning structures that are implemented at the K-5 level can be um, further enhanced at the middle school level. Middle level learners um, at times nationwide, we can see dips in performance there. I was a middle school teacher. It's a really critical time to engage students and to make sure that they feel that the work that they're doing is relevant um, and gives them opportunities for um, social learning. Middle school students are social. And so we really felt, as you're gonna hear tonight, that I am um, would be a great match for their developmental stage. Um, so we tried to anticipate all of the um, planning and um, consideration that we needed to give for that transition from fifth to sixth, from Bridges to I am. We worked to make sure that our teachers felt confident in the discourse structures and classroom routines that they need to implement um, in order to engage students with illustrative mathematics. So that's a, a little bit of how we got here, the timeline, and why we felt it was such a strong choice for our middle school. Illustrative mathematics uses a problem-based learning structure, and it's really um, a very rigorous problem-solving model where students don't just have someone demonstrate a mathematical skill and they replicate it, but rather they engage in um, problem solving in order to really have an inquiry and experience, to look at the problem, to apply their existing knowledge, to look at different strategies to solve the problem, and then the teacher brings in um, direct instruction. And so that is a, a very specific design principle in illustrative mathematics to help the students engage. If a middle level learner is walking in and it's sit down, we're just going to review your homework and I'm going to show you this one skill and then you're going to practice it. Um, it's, it's not going to have the same impact and it's not going to foster um, that mathematical problem solving that we know is so critical for the, the level of math that they're doing. Um, if you recall Pat's presentations on mathematical practice standards, how, how students engage in problem solving is a key component of that. We've talked about the dispositions that we want our students to develop as mathematicians. And as you can see on this last slide, um, illustrative mathematics really facilitates that. You're not a passive learner, you're an active learner in the classroom. So it's important that they are engaged in asking questions, identifying the skills and knowledge that they have that apply to the problem and where their next steps are for learning. So this is just another kind of graphic that lays it out. You can see step one, um, the teacher first facilitates uh, the, the question the students are gonna be working with and ensures that they understand the question and gives them the opportunity to ask any clarifying questions. The students then um, really have the opportunity to kind of try to tackle the question and the teacher is able to listen in and, and look for opportunities um, to coach into that problem solving. Um, students work together in groups to share their thinking. 
um, to see how they've been able to uh, tackle the problem. And then ultimately, they bring that learning together and talk about the different strategies that they've used. And if you recall from some of your visits to Bridges classrooms, you've seen that student to student discourse where they talk about, well, this worked for me. Um, and other students share different approaches. And so it, it helps build that flexible thinking for mathematics. And so here you can see sort of that traditional approach of more just direct modeling versus the problem-based learning and why those two approaches are different. Um, we really want our students to demonstrate stamina in mathematical problem solving and a willingness to persevere so that they don't just feel that I don't know how to do it and so I can't do it, but rather that they look for different ways to solve problems, listen to others thinking and apply the skills and knowledge that their teachers give them. And we're gonna talk about the instructional routines that the teachers use in the classroom because while this is really an inquiry model of learning mathematics, it doesn't mean that there isn't direct instruction. So I wanna make sure that, that we kind of look at those instructional routines. Before we do that, it's really important to note that illustrative mathematics is based on the idea that all students are participating, that they are all active and engaged participants in class. If you think back to your own, try to remember back your own seventh grade math classroom, maybe not everybody was so active in that setting. And so one of the key aspects of illustrative mathematics is really setting up a math community and doing that explicitly. So teachers work with students to identify how everyone's gonna participate in that math classroom, what that looks like, and really set the norms for um, a, a very active mathematics classroom. We teach explicitly different problem solving strategies so that students can really break down larger multi-step questions into more manageable segments. Um, and really, that's just another aspect of it so that the students are working through um, involved questions, very often multi-step questions. And so we want them to really be able to break those questions apart and make sure they're answering all aspects of it and they understand what the question is asking of them. And then finally, student discourse is a critical component of illustrative mathematics. Students often work in small groups. They're getting up, they're moving around the classroom. We use vertical whiteboards for them to demonstrate their mathematical thinking. Um, the teachers have started to do a book study around um, a, a text that's really transforming mathematical instruction right now, building thinking classrooms. And it really talks about the need for that active physical movement in the classroom um, and making sure that they're sharing their, their problem solving and their mathematical learning across the classroom setting, not just with one person, but with the entire class. In order to facilitate that well, we have to provide direct and explicit instruction about our expectations for student-to-student -student discourse, for collaborative learning and for problem solving. And that's all built into I am. So the earlier units in the school year reinforce those in sixth grade really introduce and then in later years reinforce those expectations. So we're not just setting it up and hoping everybody knows how to engage, but really being specific about what that looks like and what's expected of the learner. All right, I'm gonna go through your typical routines. Um, I am main goal is making sure that every student has access to grade level math content. Um, so typically when a student comes in, there's a warm up on the board or do now as we like to call it at the middle school. Then there's some sort of instructional activity, a lesson synthesis and a cool down. So the warm up is always the first event. So it's when the student comes in, they kind of put their things away and they kind of spend some time thinking on their own a little bit, trying to figure out what they know by themselves and then they collaborate on it. So um, they sometimes will either do a, a number talk, a notice and wonder or which one does not belong. So here's a notice and wonder, and the most important thing to IM is making sure that every student feels invited to the lesson. So the do now is typically something where they can pick something out, and as long as they can make sense of it, then there's really no wrong answer. So it's really giving the opportunity for them to demonstrate their mathematical reasoning, which is one of the mathematical practice skills. Here's an example of the same notice and wonder that a student did. So if you can see this, 
they are really spending the time to kind of look at every single example on there and determine what they really see and what they want to know more about. And I think as Camila mentioned, you really want them to engage. You don't want them to feel like anything that they're wondering about isn't worthy of wondering. Um, you know, we have at the middle school, just to remind you, students in sixth grade are grouped heterogeneously, but by seventh grade, they start um, to either take the grade level course or an accelerated course. We want all students, um, regardless of that math placement, to come into contact with those grade level standards and to have the same opportunity to um, really communicate what they know and what they're wondering about. And that's gonna help that teacher facilitate individualized learning. This is another example of a warm up. This is a which one doesn't belong. So students can pick any of these and justify it, but there is one that the teacher will guide them to. So if you, if you notice, three of them are all the same answer, if you simplify it. That third one, the four plus three X equals nine, that's kind of where the teacher will lead them to be able to make sense of and notice that once you simplify it, the rest of them will all be the same answer. Instructional activities. So here's where they introduce a new concept or representation. Here they formalize a definition or a term. They identify, identify and resolve common mistakes and misconceptions and they work towards mastery. So here's an example where they're identifying an, er an error. So there's three different students work and here they have to justify and figure out which, which student did it correctly. When a student can justify which student correctly, that means that they've mastered the content. So that's an important skill for them to have. So we've talked in the past where you've seen the student samples of student work about the student being able to really, you know, show their work, but also in middle school to be able to explain their thinking and justify their reasoning. Here's just some examples of solving equations. Um, so there's multiple representations. So again, it provides that access to all learners. In the first example, they're using a hanger diagram. In the second example, they're using tape diagrams. And they're again, solving equations with these, providing that visual to then get to the algorithm. And in math um, instruction, it's sort of a major foundational idea is CRA, which is really moving from concrete to representation to abstract thinking. And so that's why the models are part of this process. So they have something they can really, you know, have that visual model and then move into representation um, through the variables, numbers, and equations, and then eventually move into higher um, abstract concepts of mathematics in high school. So again, here's kind of what a classroom looks like. Um, teachers do tend to use the vertical whiteboards for a couple of reasons. Number one being that they can monitor every student's work by just like looking around the room. The second reason is if a group gets stuck, they can look to other groups for how to start. So this kind of provides examples and it keeps the other groups working. So it's sort of that natural, you know, these are classwork items where you might be problem solving if Camille and I actually went to a PD on this method together, and we were working through some something that's when we're like, well, no, what do, what do you think we should do next? But the people next to us were like, did you think about this? And we were like, oh, we get it now. And so it's that same model um, where this is active classroom learning. We want our students to be learning from each other, sharing their thinking, their independent practice comes later. But this is where we want them to have those natural opportunities. And if they're all seated separately and they're not having those opportunities to have dialogue, to recognize when they're stuck, um, it doesn't facilitate that same active classroom. So as Mary said, there's also some direct instruction. So by the end of the period, it's called the lesson synthesis, but that's when everybody comes together and we ensure that everybody understands the objective for the day. So they may either add something to their book or they may have a graphic organizer. Um, they have the opportunity to ask questions of the teacher and kind of make sure that they have met the objective for the day. So the teachers can gauge their student response to the lesson. They're seeing their work around the classroom as they're moving through their problem solving. So they're really able to target that lesson synthesis based on what we saw today, where, where did we you know, feel that we were successful? What's that next step? And then provide that instruction. Um, so they're not 
planning the lesson and then hoping everyone got it. They're observing the student performance and then teaching into the next steps. And that's an everyday routine. So it, um, it just sort of flips the classroom a little bit, but it still provides that direct instruction. And the last part of it is the cool down. At the end of class, there's about like one question that the students will have to answer. It may be an open response. It may be a quick check just to make sure that, just to see where their students are and see if they need to adjust the lesson for the next day. Um, again, as I said, I am focuses on making sure that every student has the, has the access to the grade level material. Um, they provide tasks that students can make sense of and reason about. Um, they focus on multiple approaches to solve problems and opportunities to compare thinking. So the biggest way students learn is learning from each other. They learn things better when they hear it from their peer instead of a teacher telling them that this is the way to do it. And I think what's important to note about that is when you think about our student performance data, one of the trends that we saw is that um, our high need students were not performing. And so a lot of times by middle school math, students have started to have a sense of I can do this or I can't. And the style of instruction invites everyone in um, and then the uh, and, and make sure that every student has that grade level work. They have other opportunities for support and skill development if they need it. So I think that's important to know that this is the tier one curriculum. But if I'm a student who's historically struggled, um, I'm, I'm going to get that support. If my data says, you know, I'm, I'm demonstrating a gap in that skill instruction, I can access my tier three um, lessons with Camila and the math team at another time. So we do have students who get that double dose of math every day, one that's more tailored to their skill development. And then in the math classroom, they're getting access to grade level material with support in the classroom. And when we think about next steps, you know, this is year one. This is a change in practice and it's a change in program. So we have continued professional learning for the entire middle school math team. And one of the things that we didn't highlight in today's presentation that I want to recognize Camila's leadership around is that in addition to supporting her math department um, of core four math teachers, she supports the math para educators who work in the math department, as well as the special education team. Because we, we really can't just think of our math department as our math teachers. Our special education team also supports math instruction. Um, they provide targeted instruction for students with IEP goals in math. Um, and Camila has been working with that team as well to ensure that they um, are confident and competent in the IM program and that they have access to other resources to meet um, any skill gaps that we have identified for students. So that's been a really broad undertaking, not only implementing a brand new program in two grade levels, but also facilitating professional learning um, for our special education department and facilitating co-planning meetings for grade level partners in math, as well as with their special education colleague, so that every member of the team is um, really confident in the instruction that they're providing and well resourced. So we appreciate the board's support of that. Um, in addition to Camila, we have used grant funding to bring in an IM specialist from CREC. She is the statewide lead on illustrative mathematics, district spite over her time. Um, I may have reserved it like three years in advance so that our teachers would only have the best um, and all the key PD days. Um, so we had a good, a good level of support and time where they had facilitated professional learning and then separate planning time as a grade level partnership team. We're gonna continue that next year. So that, you know, you, the first year is the first year, but there's still more learning to do and we're expanding to eighth grade next year. So we need to make sure that there's that vertical alignment across the grade levels and that our, our teachers continue to deepen their practice. We are anticipating a pilot of an IM aligned intervention program as well. That's very much at the um, infancy stage. There is not Bridges. One of the things you might remember that I highlighted about Bridges is it came with an intervention program that is does not exist, I would say, in a meaningful way at the middle school level. Um, so we felt like IM was the best program, but we happen to know that there is local development of an IM aligned intervention program. And I've asked to be the first pilot district. So we're hoping to see that so that there's real um, 
coherence for students who do receive additional math support that what's happening in their math classroom, the same language and same strategies are used in those support um, courses that they have. So those are next steps and areas for growth, I would say, as we continue the implementation in 2024, 2025. Um, in addition to professional learning, we've surveyed our teachers about, you know, regularly, I think we just did the third survey of the year, kind of one was done in sort of October, one midwinter and one now, just to continue to get their feedback about what they feel they need, what's going well and what's a challenge. I can share with you from the teacher perspective, I think something that's gone well is particularly in sixth grade, they see the impact of bridges and that their students are comfortable with student discourse, they're comfortable with trying different strategies. So that's been um, a real success. And I think a challenge has been um, it, which is not uncommon in year one of any new program, just pacing and time. Um, I think they would, which is, a, you know, if the math teachers are saying, we just want to have them longer. We want more parts of the day to be math. As you know, we promoted the family consumer science uh, position because we want more math application opportunities so that our students can continue to practice the skills that they're learning in mathematics class. So um, that's an area where we continue to finesse how to make sure the pacing works within our school day. But again, that's a very common year one issue. And usually we gain some um, efficiency the longer we work with a program and know where our students um, you know, come with strengths that maybe allows us to move ahead or areas where they need a little bit more time. So we gauge that through their student performance data and pre-assessment. Is that it? I was just gonna say, any questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, how many minutes uh, is spent on math? Uh, I think what we're for art, it was around 45 minutes per day. Is this how, what's, how much time is spent on this program? So, students have math class daily. The middle school runs a seven period day with a flex block. Um, we did have to expand lunch. You may remember this legislation was passed to make lunch 30 minutes. So, it's about 47 minutes. Do I have that right, Neil? Yes, 47 minutes. So, there's some of this. And then Follow up was you mentioned that some of those that need extra help are, are you know, have that opportunity. Yes. So they get an extra 45 minutes or so. It depends. Okay. So, and then, well, my question was what, while these people are getting their extra um, so, support, what does, what happens to the rest of the class? So the tier one math class happens daily, and every student takes math class daily. If a student uh, qualifies for support and intervention. So they're tiered intervention support that is scheduled potentially in place of a study hall. Um, the flex block that I mentioned, which is about a 25 minute block at the start of the school day, students can also be scheduled then. Um, some students have two study halls and a flex block. So they might see three you know, additional opportunities for math support, and it's not always scheduled in the exact same way. Um, if they're you know, we, we try to make sure that students can access all programming. So we work across the flex block and study halls. If a student has an IEP and receives additional instructional services in line with an IEP goal, that would, um, again, can vary depending on the way the IEP is written. It could be three times a week, four times a week. Um, it depends on the level of need for that learner. Um, and that is determined through the PPT process with the child's instructional team, special education teacher, and parent. Mm -hmm. so, so that varies. So you would put students that are of the same learning level together so they can work together on a project. So, you know, so they're all the same level of thinking and, you know, as opposed to a higher level learner who it might be, you know, might come a little quick to them. So the students who qualify for tiered instruction are typically grouped based on the skills that they're working on. And very often that's the case for IEP services as well. In the tier one setting, the math class that every learner takes daily, in sixth grade, students are uh, grouped heterogeneously, which they're mixed together based on various ability levels. Um, supports are pushed into that classroom. So if there are students who need additional support to be successful, it follows them into the classroom. In grades seven and eight, students start to be placed by math level. And so there is an, an accelerated version of that course. Um, in seventh grade, where students move through the content more quickly and start to access eighth grade skills and knowledge. And then students who are successful in the accelerated course in seventh grade are often recommended to algebra in eighth grade. And that is students who, the only students placed in algebra are students who've demonstrated certain math performance. And we look at multiple math data points to make those decisions. So we look at iReady scores that 
benchmark screening that we do three times a year. We look at their grades and we look at other um, universal screening assessments that we give on their math fluency and basic skills. So there's multiple um, pieces of data that would inform that. Parents are informed of the placement process in the fall. They're given an initial placement in the early spring and then a final placement at the end of the school year um, so that they kind of have a sense that this is what we're going to look at by March, end of March. Um, we're telling them, you know, here's what we're thinking based on what we've seen. And then we do wait until we have that final iReady score. And any, you know, there are times that students are, you know, demonstrate some improvement and then we might reconsider um, that placement in the spring. I think that doesn't quite mesh with me is we don't know the scores, like you're saying, we're not going to have a presentation until September. That's but a smart balanced assessment, the state right. assessment. Right, but isn't that what you base your assessments no, on? No. Or, no? So like the smart balance decisions you're talking about with how to place right. students in the school year, it's like it seems like it's too late. Smart balance is too late, Sally, you're right. And so we rely more heavily on I ready internally, although and we see it's very rare that if we are con a, a student's performance is higher on Smarter Balance than on all of their local assessments. We, we find that our students demonstrate consistency across our internal assessments and Smarter Balance. You trust our internal assessments more than them. Not more than, I just find that there is a good deal of consistency. Hmm. Um, we always look at Smarter Balance data when we have it, but to your point, it's often delayed from when some decision-making has to, has to be made. We reference previous scores, however, so I didn't I didn't specify that. So if we see a trend that you're consistently four is the highest score you can get on Smart and Balanced, if you're consistently as four on Smart and Balanced since third grade, and all of your other student performance data more recently demonstrates that you're performing on that level, then we have a good sense of that that level of performance. But Sometimes we have students who are toggling between sort of a developing and proficient level. And so we really want to look at those scores carefully. Um, and it is challenging for scheduling purposes when we don't have final data until late summer. But again, it's very rare. I wouldn't say it's never happened. It's very rare that we get a significant outlier in Smart and Balanced, um, in my experience, in this district. And students get homework? Students do receive homework, yes. Thanks. Yep. I, I have a question or a comment or whatever. Um, the the bridges in the IM book, I think, are really high on DOK 3 and 4, yeah. which is really nice, and it crosses over to literacy beautifully, right? I love that bridges has something really, really specific to special ed. Yeah. And so I was going to ask you about sure. IM, whether or not they have some really happy here you're looking for that, as opposed to people kind of making up right. something to tie into the mainstream. I thought I am went all the way down to elementary. Does it not? It does. And, and if it does, how come we didn't just like choose that all the way through? So our elementary teachers did look as part of the pilot process we did at the elementary level back in 2021. I am was considered, and the fact that I am is not just K eight; it's K twelve right. was something that they looked at. They did not feel they strongly felt. I would say the teacher committee. They felt that I am was not a fit for the primary learner in particular. Um, Memorial felt strongly it was not a fit. Um, they did not feel that um, the the learner that they were seeing come into school, particularly post COVID, had the stamina and social learning that was necessary for I am. Um, so they felt very much, you know, that, th that they are doing more social teaching and that they wanted to make sure that they had a program that did that in a way they felt was developmentally appropriate. And they just felt they just did that better. As director of curriculum I had some concerns that, you know, what does that do for our middle school? And so as that first slide talked about that timeline right away, when I kind of anticipated elementary really feeling that Bridges was the right choice for them that I had to be cognizant of what did that mean beyond. And so that's when we started to look at where are those high growth, high performance districts, and many of them were Bridges K-5, I am 6 -8. And Lindsay Ramos from CREC, who I mentioned has come in with her expert perspective, has worked with many of those districts. So she was really, and, and Camila's research as well, I have to highlight that, that she 
has a whole network of school systems that she relies on, you know, as we often use colleagues in other districts to talk to about how did you solve this problem? What did this look like for you? And so we benefited from some of the lessons in those districts. And um, for example, in the year that we were piloting IM, our sixth grade teachers went to observe a specific unit in Bridges at Center School so they could see how Bridges taught it because she had highlighted that as like, that might be one where you wanna see the sequencing of bridges so to I am. Open sequence the fifth or sixth. Yeah, and we haven't had any issue with that because they're both so standards aligned. You know, the, the content and skills I don't think is an issue. It's just every now and then it's like a language issue or a different strategy. Um, and until we have an IM aligned intervention program that we feel is beneficial to our tiered supports as well as special education, we have been um, formalizing what special, special education is using at the middle school through iReady. Um, so we have some instructional seats at the middle school, but more importantly, we've really worked with our special education team this year to look at how they can pull out specific lessons aligned to skill needs. So giving a more guaranteed resource, because we shared that concern that um, we need a consistent process, but we're really hopeful that the new intervention program that is slated for release next year will meet many needs. Any other questions on culture of math? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So moving on. Unfinished business item 11.1. .1. Review of recommended board of education policy 1330 use of schools and facilities. I can't read. Do I have a motion? I move to accept the recommendation of the superintendent of schools and the board of education policy and curriculum committee to approve policy 1330. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Yeah, I'd like to just address it real quick. Um, Paul, is there any rush um, to get this policy done? Is there any pressing needs to be on the books since well? There is not. However, um, I think the concern that you heard is not really founded. Um, this this policy was written and updated in 2014 before I came, and as the high school was being built, there was the notion that the high school should be accessible to all groups, and that has been the standard uh, since then. So any nonprofit group, and I've always used roughly 50% East Hampton because we've not allowed nonprofit groups. I mean, we've had a lot of requests to use our auditorium uh, from a rock band, from Colchester and other things. So we've said they've got to be nonprofit groups in our community. And we we don't charge fees. The only thing that uh, the town, when they use it for recreation or the outside groups, the only thing they have to do is pay for custodial services if they are in the building when custodians are not regularly in the building. Now, our buildings are staffed till 11 o'clock at night, so if they do a weeknight event, as long as they're cleaned up and out, then there's no issue. If they do a weekend performance, then they pay for the for the, the overtime for the, for the custodian. So it's not exclusionary in the way that... I don't think it's... I think we have one of the most open policies uh, for usage, uh, any town group is always welcome in. Um, any recreation group is welcome in. We don't charge recreation to use the facility. Obviously, we have a good relationship with the town. They plow our driveways. We don't want to pay them to plow our driveways and you know have them pay us. To do. Just doesn't make sense to have taxpayers' money go from one pocket to to another. I think we have a great relationship with uh, nonprofit groups. We've never said no to any of the community uh, drama programs uh, in town. We don't ask them for a list of, you, you know, East Hampton residents versus non-East Hampton residents. But typically, you know, most of those are, you know, being run by East Hampton residents, and we we've not had an issue. I would only recommend that we do this because, as you are aware, you were deciding whether to let outside groups use like the tennis courts during the school day. We cleared up the language in this. Uh, my recommendation is that you pass it and ask your new superintendent to revisit it uh, mm -hmm. after a year and make sure that this is this is smooth. What else can we pass on? 
<laughs> the, the pie in my office is getting larger every day. <laughs> Paul, for the record, just so people know, if we were to reject someone's application, well, what would their recourse be? There is no recourse. They couldn't come to the board no. or, or something. To... No, I think we, we tried to clear it up that the decision of the superintendent and the building, um, it says superintendent and or the board reserve the right to reject any or all requests. Right, so they could come to the board if you decide. Just uh, anyone can complain. I think we yeah. we kind of we kind of removed that as an option because it always it said the board of education. Yeah. Now we said the the superintendent. I think if the superintendent is recommending that the building not be used for a certain thing, we should not be inviting people to to just come to the board and ask over daddy's head um and i you know we're not rejecting a lot of of different groups i think people understand that we allow the town groups to use our our building and you can imagine before this building we were hosting planning and zoning meetings at the high school and everything like that so i think we've been very generous with our facilities uh, but we're also very careful about you know especially some of the we allowed a local uh dance company to use the building mm -hmm. and they make a donation to the high school or project graduation each year but we're very careful about outside dance companies mm -hmm. uh just because of the wear and tear and the feathers and the beads and <laughs> litter, things like that yes thank you thank you any other questions yeah. thank you paul i appreciate you clarifying Yes. That was okay. Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Josh, what was your vote? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Item eleven point two. Aye. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I move to accept the recommendation of the superintendent of schools and the board of education policy and curriculum committee to approve policy six one four one point three two one. Second. Motion and second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Josh? Aye. Okay, Aye. thank you. Okay, new business 12.1 review of recommended board of education policy 6146.11 class rank. This is the first read. Is there any questions, any discussion that needs to be had over this policy? I thought we agreed at the policy meeting we were going to revisit this. Yeah, this we did the first read. This is first read. Okay. And we did we, we did. I think we agreed that we were going to use the audit language, and I was going to get the audit language from the guidance department in the high school, and that is included in your first read. Okay. So if you have any concerns uh, at the next meeting, we can address that or. If you want to look at it now, you can make any comments. Okay. Any further questions on this first read? Hearing none, moving on to 12.2, review of the new teacher evaluation and development plan and the administrator evaluation and development plan, first read. Okay. That might be personnel, not problem. Okay, thank you. So this is the first read of the East Hampton Public Schools Educator Evaluation and Development Model. I just wanted to bring some information to your attention as you go through that document as it's lengthy. Um, and it reflects uh, our obligation as a school district to revisit our educator evaluation plan. Um, before I jump into the plan itself, I just want to stress that this was developed by your Professional Development and Evaluation Committee, or PDEC, as we refer to them, um, which is required by state legislation. So um, it is something that between now and June 10th, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, Educator Eval, just to give you a little backstory, went through a major transformation in about 2012, um, when the governor at that time and the state department at that time put in place a very specific uh, evaluation system um, that all districts had to follow across the state. And I think 2012 is a little bit like 2014. And the, um, there's been an update to the state guidelines. You might remember me bringing this up in brief updates to you over the past couple of years. 
Um, the state level committee that oversees evaluation heard a lot of feedback from districts about that uniform, uniform system that we had for about um, 12 years and wanted to reconsider some aspects. In addition, um, some of that conversation was accelerated, I would say, during um, COVID. There were flexibilities offered to districts about how to try some different things with evaluation because obviously teachers were teaching under extreme circumstances. And so we really wanted to look at how we could support the educator, the student, and overall improvement. Um, and so this has been in the works for a long time. Despite the fact that it's been in the works for the long, a long time, some resources from the state were a little delayed that we were expecting. So we knew as of last spring that we had to redesign, I know, redesign our evaluation model, but some of the supports that were to come maybe were, were not available properly. But I would say by October, November, your PDF was well into the development work. We got a key piece of support in February from the state that was supposed to come in September, um, which was their model plan. Your PDF really liked the state model plan and relied heavily on that. Okay, so we'll jump in at this point. So key things I want you to be aware of. No, Okay. <laughs> oh, now it's working over time. Uh, so oh, now it's going great. I'm supposed to see any of this yet. Yeah, sorry. We talk so fast. fast. And the core design principles. Yeah. Uh, now, core design principles. So um, these are seven aspects of educator eval that we were asked to consider and integrate into our evaluation plan. And really, I think when we think about the range of educators we have and the goals of a public school system, there's a lot here that makes sense. So first is differentiating for roles. So we have educators who are under the umbrella of educator, but they do very different things. The school psychologist is really different from a second grade classroom teacher. It's really different from a PE teacher. Um, there's some really important similarities there, but there's also some differences. We also have teachers who have been in East Hampton for 25 years. We have teachers who are new to East Hampton, but have been educators for 15 years. We have teachers who are brand new. So one of the things we're looking at is how to give a little bit more choice and flexibility because um, not everyone needs the same thing exactly all the time. Simplify and reduce the burden. The previous version of Educator Val, that uniform system I spoke of, was burdensome. Just, I think, universally it would be perceived that way. There's a lot of great things about it. But it was routinely viewed that way, I think, by teachers and to some degree by administrators um, because of some of the, the steps in paperwork. So I wouldn't say we had to make massive changes in that area, but we were able to streamline things in some places. Um, they talked about focusing on things that matter. So really engaging the teacher in the evaluation process to set goals that they're passionate about and that they believe will make significant changes and improvements for their students. Connect to best practices, so really thinking about how we can engage teachers in action research, and also allow for consideration of the whole child. So the previous evaluation model required all educators to set, set student growth performance targets for students and really use student performance data to determine their effectiveness. The new educator eval model allows for that, but you can have other goals as well. Um, in other words, if I'm a science teacher and I want to look at how I can help my students improve on NGSS, I could set a target, a, a data point target on NGSS, but I could also look at aspects of NGSS aligned curriculum that maybe I could um, enhance in my classroom and I could research that side of things. So the goal is always to improve student performance but it doesn't mean that your measure for that year is just in an isolated data point. It might be about more of a learning process that you engage in. Number five, I think is, is probably the crux. There's has to be engagement on edu educator growth and agency. Um, East Hampton is very fortunate. I know I stood here in August and talked about staffing for the 23-24 school year. 
and that we were proud to start the school year with every position in the district filled. Many of our colleagues and other districts cannot say that because of a increasing teacher shortage nationally, not unique to Connecticut. And while we are still able to recruit strong candidates in this community, we're very proud of that. I think that the profession um, has struggled in recent years and engaging teachers, helping them have choice, helping them have voice and feeling that their professional learning is impactful on their classroom, their students is something that is definitely one of the core design principles of this system. Um, always giving opportunities for meaningful professional learning. I think that's an area we're already doing well a lot, not perfectly, um, but we do survey our teachers all the time on this. And while they give us feedback and new topics, they are also often you know, complementary of the PDAC and, and what's provided. And then always a core design principle, but one that some of the streamlining of the process is meant to enhance is that teachers receive specific, timely, accurate, and actionable feedback. So those are sort of the underlying principles when you view the plan and you have the opportunity to read it in depth. You always want to come back to these because this is at the, the core of what's been planned. For all the ways I'm going to show you that there's some changes, there's a lot that's the same. So this graphic represents the educator continuous learning process. So really, we're still following a specific process of goal setting in the fall, a mid-year check-in, and a spring end-of-year evaluation and reflection. That hasn't changed. Um, and you can see that around that process of setting goals, meeting with your administrator to check in and describe how that's going and the impact it's having on your students and your practice are observations of professional practice. That means observing teachers in your classroom as well as in their other duties. Teachers do a lot of things and classroom instruction is a big component of what they do, but they participate in meetings, they facilitate meetings, um, whether it's a PPT meeting, a grade level meeting, a department meeting, um, they engage with parents in formal sessions, they lead open house evenings, they go to data team meetings. I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of professional work away from their students. And so we observe all of that to give meaningful feedback because there's a lot of connections between the work you do outside of the classroom and your growth there and the work you do in the classroom. So this graphic is also a good one to come back to. You'll see it in the plan but it's really an ongoing uh, goal setting process with your evaluator. They have three touch points with their assigned um, 092 administrator, fall, winter, spring. The sixth slide goes into a little bit more detail about what happens at each of those meetings. So it's not a casual meeting, it's a very formal meeting. Um, so you're gonna start the beginning of the year reflecting. Um, there's a formal self-reflection process they have to go through. And really starting to plan your goals for the year. You're going to develop those goals and present them with a rationale to your administrator, along with any necessary professional learning or action research you might conduct as a teacher. Professional learning is not all formal, we bring in an outside speaker. It's collaborating with colleagues, it's book studies, it is observing other colleagues in this district or elsewhere. So they can kind of come up with an action plan. Something that's not clearly stated in the plan itself or in my presentation is that Connecticut has a you know, nationally recognized teacher induction process referred to as TEAM. And it's really what beginning educators go through and it is an action research project. And it's been viewed as successful and supportive of beginning teachers. And so elements of that are really involved in the new teacher evaluation plan where you're designing that action research and thinking about where am I finding consistent success as an educator and where do I want to grow and how can I research and learn about that. Then you have that goal setting conference still in that column um, under orange goal setting. Um, and that's going to be where you mutually agree with your administrator. You have to reach consensus on a one, two or three year goal. Um, and you can also new to this uh, process have a group goal. So if a grade three team all feels like they want to work on the same thing, there's, there's you know, power in numbers. Um, and so that's um, something that's been allowed for in the past and remains available under this plan. Um, by the mid-year, you're going to have that check-in meeting. And, and then again, in the spring, you're going to have an end of year reflection, report out on the progress with your goals. Um, and you're going to have a summative conference with your evaluator where they give you formal feedback from throughout the year. In the past, teachers have received ratings. They are either, you know, um, 
a one, two, three, or four. There's there's terms associated, whether you're proficient or you know um, a, a an expert educator. But this process no longer provides for a specific rating. It's feedback rich. Um, it's really meant to focus on the administrator's overall impression of your performance in all of your professional settings and their observations of you in the classroom. Quick question. Sure. Um, how did that not become subjective? Like, whether you agree with the one through four or not, it does take the, it, the rationale behind it, right, is that you take some of that subjectivity out. Right. And if I say, I find, think you've got a two in this area, which most teachers don't like, you could say, okay, well, let's look at the three. Show me what you did, because there's elements in three, right? So you tell me, yeah. oh, you're right, you proved it, and I'm gonna bump you up to a three or a four, whatever. So if this is feedback rich, like that's very subjective. So for observations and for even professional performance in domain four, every district still has to align to an external set of standards. Our PDEC decided to stay with the Connecticut Core of Teaching, the CTT rubric 2017. Um, that exists for classroom teachers as well as for you know support specialists. And so that resource doesn't go away. It's just used a little bit differently. So I think you would still reference that. Um, it's we'll talk in a few minutes about it being translated in what's referred to as a single point competency for use in the classroom. But if I'm an evaluator having a summative conference and I want to look at descriptors, I can still go through that process of this is where I see you landing. Mm -hmm. I've looked at all my feedback, all of the data I've collected, and your own evidence. So I think it's still evidence rich um, to help with that calibration. We also plan to ensure that our um, administrators have calibration experiences and really look at how to apply this. So there's a lot to roll out here. We have a new administrator plan, a new teacher plan, PDEC today established a working committee to roll out the educator training side of it. And the next step is that administrator training, which we're already um, starting to formulate. How does um, this align with the goals of the administration? Whereas, for example, we had a close call where one of our uh, teachers who was specialized in, I think it was technology, I remember right, was might have was thinking of leaving and that would have been a, a, a gaping hole in that area that would be very hard to fill because of the teacher shortage that we're talking about. So shouldn't we be looking at trying to raise up, it's, if a teacher is new or young, say that way, and energetic and wants to expand and you see, um, I don't like, basically I don't want to see, we lose one person and leaves a gap that um, it's gonna be hard to fill. It would be nice to have brought up someone if they're looking for goals, you could suggest, for example, a technology, I'll just join a technology. Sure. That you, you, know, one might, you, you might want to increase your knowledge in education and technology. So that way there, we, if we were to lose someone, we have we have someone there right there that home road that you know, wouldn't leave a kid in the of that process. So I was wondering, my question, how is administration goals sure. uh, correspond with the teacher goals? So we encourage them to work towards helping our. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, well, I think we, I'm just going to pause everybody. I think we're going to let Mary finish sure. her yeah. presentation and then we can address because this really doesn't deal with evaluation. That's a little, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that at the end, but I'll be happy to. That's really looking a little bit more at certification, which is very separate from evaluation. It's a it's a, a area of, of great interest to me actually. Yeah. I can tell you, I spent a lot of time on certification, but yeah. it is not directly related to this. Okay. Um, other than administrators are there to provide formal evaluations of their staff, formal feedback, and also mentor and support teachers. And so, um, carrying multiple certifications is a savvy thing to do as a classroom teacher. And um, I think we look for opportunities to, to support that process where we can, but that takes place outside the evaluation process and okay. has to be through the teacher's own decision-making because of the steps they need to take to achieve additional certifications. Okay. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? That's much Yeah, I think. 
I'm off. You? Okay, there. Change a little. Nice story. Slide fact. Do you want to go to that? Next slide is going to talk about what's the same in educator eval. And there, there are some aspects that are not a change. And it's important to note that whatever we're doing with educator evaluation, it has to be aligned with legislative guidelines. So this isn't of our local and sort of original design. Um, so first and foremost, what's the same? There are still three goal meetings, as I indicated, beginning of the year, mid-year, end of year. So that's been in place, it's not new. Um, and it continues. So teachers have that regular touch point with their administrator. Professional growth goals. So making sure that we're establishing targets for the school year um, that guide us. That's been something teachers have been doing and will continue to do. They just have any flexibility. Observations of teacher performance and professional practice during instruction. So administrators are in classrooms um, and, and observing teachers as they instruct and interact with students. Review of practice, the term is, for outside of classroom uh, instruction. So away from your classroom instruction, how do you engage? Um, are you in, engaging in those data team meetings? Are you participating in your grade level or department planning meeting? Um, those are all opportunities to, to provide feedback because how you work with your colleagues and how you look at student performance data or other instructional practices uh, continues to impact your classroom instruction. Our observation rubric has not changed. I referenced the CT, CCT, it should be, sorry, that's a typo. It's not CT, it's C, CCT, Connecticut Core of Teaching, Rubric for Effective Teaching. You can click on that link um, and you can really look at that rubric in more depth. It was produced by the state of Connecticut. It's been in use in this district for many years. And then an annual teacher self-reflection so that they themselves each year are taking the time to think through how they're doing. They used to do that against the rubric they're going to do that a little bit differently. And then some of the feedback from your evaluator is still part of the process. What's new? Uh, educator voice in the observation process. So this is really looking at all of those core design principles where teachers need to have the opportunity to have a bit more agency. So now the observations um, can look different and teachers have voice in which structure. We've laid out different options for them and they can work with their administrator to decide which observation cycle makes the most sense for them that year. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Goal length doesn't have to be a one-year goal. It used to have to be a one-year goal. Now it can be a multi-year goal. Some things are worthy of longer study and some are short-term. The type of goal, it no longer has to be student performance data driven. Although I can tell you a lot of our teachers are like, I might do both. I'm used to that. So it feels better to let go of that. But they can also set goals that are not as um, specific in tying to student performance data, but could still impact it. And then a single point competency rubric, the CCT rubric describes what effective practice looks like in four different domains with many different indicators under each domain. And it tells you what that you know, below standard looks like, developing, proficient, and exemplary describes that for every indicator. So it's a very involved document. And if you've not looked at it before, I would encourage you to do so. The state is requiring districts to move to a single point competency rubric. This is one of these streamlined strategies. Let's just describe what it should look like and give feedback based on that. That's basically what they've asked us to do here. Doesn't mean the CCT goes away because we have to use the full version. We have to be aligned to an external standard, but it just means that in practice, if you're observing a teacher, you're really looking at what's the ideal um, version of this aspect of teaching and what did I see, but reflections and, and strengths. So in observations, you have three different options. Option A is one comprehensive 
observation for at least 30 minutes. The administrators typically stay for the full period. That has a pre and a post observation meeting. It's what we would refer to now as a formal observation. You already have teachers who have, that's one of the, the ways that they're valued is through one formal observation. Option B is two focused observations. Again, at least 20 minutes. Um, and again, that is something that exists in your existing plan. Option C is for snapshot observations where you would have multiple observations, three that are a minimum of 10 minutes. So that's the difference between someone coming in and watching one full lesson or doing sort of mini shorter visits or mini visits to kind of get a picture over time. We, we talked a lot about this. Um, different members of the committee felt like it should be one formal. That's what the state plan actually requires. Let's just leave it at that. But there were other educators who felt like you know, I've been doing this a long time. I don't need that formal event. I want someone to come in and see me, you know, see my classroom in its natural state. Come in anytime you want and do like a quick visit. So there are also times that depending on your professional growth goal, if you're really focused on an instructional, for example, illustrative mathematics, you may want to invite your administrator in to say, I really want you to see an entire problem-based learning lesson because I really need to better understand how I'm going to synthesize that lesson at the end. So I want you to hear from beginning to end. Another um, teacher may be working on classroom routines and transitions. If I'm a very new teacher and I teach, say, first grade, that's really critical. And so I might want someone to come and see me in the fall, where probably there's some room for growth, and come back and see snapshots. I don't need to stay 45 minutes to see how the students transition. A classroom found is founded on strong routines and transitions. So it's actually a very worthy goal for like one year, but it might be best observed multiple times. So those are some examples of why teachers felt if they're gonna have choice on goals, they need to have choice on observations. And again, teacher agency is one of the core design principles. Goals, I kind of already said this, they can be one, two or three year goals that are mutually agreed upon with the administrator. They can be a professional growth goal where I'm looking at practice that will support my students or it can be a student learning growth goal. Um, it's, they have choice in that. Again, all of that choice has to be mutually agreed upon with the administrator. So if the administrator says, I, I just am struggling to understand why this is the best approach, they would continue to have those conversations until they got to a point they both supported. Um, so there's a lot of different things that people might wanna look at. Um, and the traditional SLO is what they do now, the student learning objective. Self-reflection, it currently is at the end of the year. It's gonna be at the beginning of the year to prompt reflection and to help inform your goals. Um, it used to be that you scored yourself on that rubric, but teachers felt like we do the same thing every year. It's not as reflective as it could be. So now they have open-ended questions that they have to respond to. The single point competency rubric. So I've described this. It's based on the CCT rubric. It's, um, there's no rating. Instead, it's feedback based on what, this is teacher language, pros and goals. So here you can see um, the, the CCT rubric for effective teaching is linked there, that um, this is really looking at domain one, a positive learning environment, student engagement and commitment to learning. This isn't the whole thing. It's much longer what they get feedback on, but it shows you that it's describing what we want to see. It's an assets based approach. This is what should be happening. And then, Areas of strength, the administrator can highlight, like, this was great, I saw this and that, and speak specifically to the rubric language, but also those growth areas for improvement or next steps. We need to see more of this. Um, that's where the teacher is going to get that feedback. So it's still rooted in the rubric, but it's streamlined. So what's next? We don't move forward until you approve the draft plan that you now have. Um, the personnel subcommittee. I met with previously, so they reviewed it. Our first read is tonight, second read would be June 10th. Then it has to go to the State Department of Education for approval. And then um, from there, we hope to hear as soon as possible. I've already reached out to the talent office at the State Department of Education to let them know our plan is ready and that we're eager for their feedback. So as soon as we have an approved plan from you, um, I've already said from the draft, I'm not really supposed to do that, but I said, I really like to be first. Okay. So you sure you don't want to look because they said it had to be in by July 1. They moved it to August 1 because some districts felt that they needed more time, which is a very fair way to feel. And um, they are saying we, we hope to respond by September 16th. 
Um, in my experience, that's a aggressive timeline for them to give feedback and approval to every, from the August 1 to September 16th, that's an aggressive timeline for them to give feedback to every district in the state. So I hope to get in the front of the line. Um, because if we have a board approved and SDE approved plan, then um, we have an evaluation platform we use that hosts all of this data and all the forms. So ideally I'd be setting that up in July. We already have a working committee that wants to plan meaningful PE for teachers. We'd like to do that in August because all of these things have specific times of year. So if we have to make any changes from the state level, I wanna know as soon as possible um, because it backs into all of those other practical implementation components. And we want our teachers to come in feeling confident. Evaluation is a vulnerable process. And so we want them to feel confident and knowledgeable in what that plan is and that the systems that support that are up and running and professional and polished for them. We expect that, so I'd like to give that to them. I've provided you additional resources so that if you're wondering, um, I've given you access to the current version of the East Hampton Public Schools Educator Evaluation and Development Model. The Connecticut Guidelines, frankly, that second bullet, that is the, the norms of the day. Um, and I highlighted um, that we received this, it's dated in August, it was really distributed in September. Starting on page five, um, if you wanna cut to the chase, it talks about what your plan must do and then where you have some choice. And I think you'll see that we exercise to that choice in places. The model plan was distributed in February and then there's a CEA model plan that came out last fall. Your PDEC looked at both of those model plans. They thought they were gonna to wanna to follow CEA. We had CEA come in and, and lead some, some sessions with them. They ended up really liking the SDE plan better. And so it relies, your plan relies heavily on the SDE plan. What's important to know about that is if the board and PDEC cannot agree on the plan, then you follow the SDE plan. So you're, you're kind of, you have a lot already pulled from that plan. Okay. I, I just want to recognize the PDEC. They put a lot of time and effort into this. You have a great district leadership team there. Um, just to remind, I know you have the names at the beginning. You have Beth Haydu, Carrie Snercha, and Liz Pezzi from Memorial School. Carrie Benigni, Eileen Erlinson, and Kate Cody from Center School. Carrie Parsons, Camila Lewis, and Pam Pem from the Middle School. And Regina Delavope, who's the co-chair, and Melissa Reynolds from the High School. Eric Ferner and Chris Sullivan serve on this committee with me. So all of those voices came together to produce this plan. And I want to highlight Liz Pezzi from Memorial, Kate Cody from Center, Carrie Parsons from Middle, and Regina Delavope from the High School, who were a subcommittee who did a lot of drafting between meetings and then brought that back to the larger you know, think tank of that group. So you have a lot of their authentic work here and what they'd like to see happen move forward. Um, and they've put a lot of time and, and passion into that work. So wanted to make sure you had all of that because it's a big document to make sense of. So thank you for your time. Madam Chair, I move to approve the new teacher evaluation and development plan and the administrator evaluation and development plan. I second. Are we waiving the first read? This is the first read. We're doing second yeah. read. In light of getting this to the state as soon as possible and approve as soon as possible, okay. I'm moving tonight. Motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yeah. Um, um, is this not a policy? Is that a question? Yes. It's, a, it's not. It's a no. It's Your not policy a, says that teachers will be evaluated by. This is a, a plan, plan developed by the state. Okay, so it's not. Or okay. developed by us based on the state requirements. Okay, just it's not like a policy that we follow that we need to, you know, you know, we don't want to go against or for legal reasons or, you know, stuff like that. You know what I, you know what I mean? If, if, so policy references this plan. Okay. If this is not a policy in and of itself. Both the Teacher plan and the admin plan are a step by step plan. Okay. So I don't think that there's so it's more of a plan, not a policy. It is a plan. Okay. That, that's it. That's all. That's, that was my question. It's a plan. Not a policy. Okay. Is there a discussion on? Yeah, I, I, I'm not, not to insult anybody or say I don't trust people's discretion. But the first who made me look at it was to make it was like a moment to get justice. I think that's fair. What was that? I have not set eyes on this for this presentation. You gave us a lot of wonderful resources and information 
I completely trust you guys, but I would like to be able to digest it for 48 hours or something before making an opinion or passing something on it. Other thoughts and feelings? I would agree with that. What do you think? Are there, is there any significant advantage merely to expediting this? Um, the the state, it's hard for me to anticipate how ready they are to evaluate plans and provide feedback. When I reached out proactively to say, would you want to look before I go to my board? Because I would rather know now if you have some concerns, we could address them. My sense was that they were still finalizing how they would do that. Um, I can't know that for sure. I'm not there. So I think there's probably not a significant shift between now and June 10th if board members wanted more time. Um, I can continue to, to talk to the state and let them know we anticipate having it ready to go and looking at drafts with them. So I could continue to do that behind the scenes if that's helpful. In that respect, I agree with Amy that maybe it'd be helpful to have a little bit more time to All right, I'll withdraw. Thank you. Does anyone have future business? Um, not complaint I hear, especially from parents, is about transportation right now. Um, and apologies if we have this in the coming down the pike and all, but I'm wondering if it might be as good to have sort of a, a review of how we put together bus routes. And, uh, and I know there's been a tremendous amount of turnover and a tremendous amount of. Um, that's just, you know, it's been difficult here for hiring bus drivers. Sure. Um, I, and, you know, Matt, I don't think the issue is the bus routes. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a shortage of drivers at, at this point. Um, but we can give you, you know, we can come back with some statistics and things like that, but it's going to come down to not enough bus drivers for the, the routes we have. I think it would be helpful for them to see that. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Future business. Personnel actions were completed with the acceptance of the, the acceptance of the consent agenda earlier this evening. Um, audience of citizens, I'm suspecting none. No. Okay. Calendar of events, Mr. Smith. Lengthy. I think we Mary went through an extensive list. Yeah. Um, you've got the uh, June three, and uh, I hope you'll be able to come to graduation. We always save a row in the front for board members. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. In favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. All right, Josh. I'll talk to you later.